So we've just looked at a spring force that uh, can be expressed in terms of a uh, conservative potential and energy that tells us how much energy is stored when we compress or stretch the spring. And if we just have kinetic energy and the uh, spring potential or spring energy in our system, then by conservation of energy, we will just have a spring that oscillates forever once it's stretched, which is great. That's in principle what should happen in an ideal system. But in the real world, uh, there are many other kinds of energies. There is heat, there is acoustic waves, um, and so there are energies that we are not going to be tracking in our simulation. For example, the, uh, the energy that's, give, that's converted from elastic or kinetic into heat or sound or mechanical def uh, failure, fracture, crushing, and so forth, damage. So we want to take all those energies that we won't be modeling and we want to kind of account for them. And the way we account for them is by saying that our system will lose energy over time. It will dissipate. And so dissipation is really the process of modeling all of those energies that we're not accounting for that I just mentioned. So what about in the case of the spring? If we are trying to model a robotic arm or some object, a tree branch or some object in the real world, in general, it won't have a perfect spring in a frictionless, dissipation-free environment. In general, there will be some amount of damping or loss of energy over time. So how does loss occur? in a spring connecting particles I and J. Well, one way to model, and these are just models of loss, one way to model the loss is as we just saw before, by just modeling separately from uh, everything you see here, just focusing on this particle, modeling the air hitting this particle, so a kind of a drag on this particle in isolation. But Sometimes the air drag may be negligible, but there may be a mechanical dissipation inside the spring itself. For example, uh, if you take two objects connected by a spring, it might be that as you hurl them through space or through the air, they will tumble without much noticeable effect from air drag. But if you uh, pull on, if you have one object on here and the other down here of the spring and you pull down and release, it will bob up and down uh, and then eventually it will come to rest. And what made it come to rest? Well, there was some amount of energy lost in the oscillation of the spring itself. So we want to see if we can model energy decay directly inside the spring. Sometimes we draw this as a dash pot or a damper. So this, I think of this like as a bike pump. There's some air coming in and out of here as this moves in and out. And each time it slows the spring down. Some of the energy is converted into acceleration of this air, which is then dissipated into the environment. So this kind of slowing down of the spring should only act in the direction of the spring. And how fast should this force act? Well, we'll take the same idea that we took for an individual particle moving through the air. We'll say that the force should be proportional to the velocity. But which velocity? The velocity of xi, the velocity of xj. If both particles are moving at the same speed, do we expect any force due to this damper here? No, because it is not sliding in and out at this case. The only time this damper is sliding in and out is when there's a relative velocity between xi and xj. That is xj dot minus xai dot is not equal to zero. 
So this is what we want to penalize. We want to counteract the, vol the relative velocity between xi and xj, not how much they both move together. And do I want to counteract any relative velocity between an xi and xj? For example, suppose that this whole picture here was rotating over time. So we just have it spinning. At, as it's spinning, you have that xj is moving upward and xi is moving downward. And so there is a relative velocity between them. One is moving up, the other is moving down. Clearly, this difference is not 0. But it's just due to a rotation. There's no actual relative motion along the direction of the spring. So how can we measure relative motion along the direction of the spring? We use our trusty unit vector, n hat. And we say, let's take the dot product of the difference of velocities with n hat. This then gives us only the relative velocity along the direction of the spring. So now once we have this relative velocity, we want to exert an equal and opposite force on both sides. And how and in which direction should this force act? Well, again, it should act along the direction of the spring. So it should act in the direction of n hat. So if this looks confusing, just look at this for a second. This is a vector valued quantity. Dot product another vector. This gives us a real number, which then scales this vector. So in the end, we get a vector along the direction n hat. And as always, we'll have some kind of coefficient in front that modulates how much damping we have. So if beta is equal to 0, the spring is completely undamped. And if beta is high, the spring is very damped. And now we need to be careful about choosing the sign. If we have a plus sign in front of this, does this correspond to fi or does this correspond to fj? That's the question. Well, let's look at this to figure this out. Let's just start assigning some direction to this. Suppose that the, these uh, particles are approaching each other. And so if they're approaching each other, we expect a force outward, a force that slows the approach. So if they're approaching each other, we expect that the force acting on j is in the direction n. And the force acting on i is opposing the direction n. So they're approaching each other. So if they're approaching each other, is xj minus xi dot n positive or negative? Let's see. xj is pointing this way. It appears positively here, so we have a vector this way. Minus xi. xi is pointing this way. But we are negating it, so we have a vector this way. So we're adding this vector to another vector, both of which point this way. So our result points this way, which is opposite of n. So the dot product with n will make this a negative number. We now have a negative number times a positive coefficient times n will give us a vector that points opposite of n. So we get a vector pointing opposite of n. So does that give us fi or does it give us fj? Well, fi is the one that we expect to be opposite of n in this case. And then fj is computed by just negative of the same expression. So now we have a way of modeling loss of energy within a spring due to damage to the spring, due to heat being given off, or sound being given off, or anything that we haven't accounted for in our simulation that might occur in the real world to transfer energy away from elastic and kinetic into other forms of energy. And that's what dissipation gives us.